Bam. And this is Peter Karasotis, and you're watching the Break It Down Live show. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. I love, I love baseball. I love that baseball is maybe golf and baseball are the two most international giant sports. I mean, you got tennis and golf have a claim there, but it's uh it's amazing. Such a complex and big sport can be so inter I mean, there's probably 30 countries that actively pay, play it on a big scale. Yeah, basketball's got some countries around the world. They're all trying to market themselves, you know, football's trying to do the same thing and yeah, obviously basketball's become big internationally. Uh, I found it interesting that uh, the Dodgers with Shohei Otani now, the first game of the season is the Seoul series in South Korea against the San Diego Padres. So that's really going to tap into the Asian market uh, in a bigger way than it already is because there's players from Japan, yeah. Korea, uh, Thailand, and you know it's, it's, it's becoming a big sport over there. Going back to when our man Felipe Alou was with the Giants, they used to go over and, and, and play in Japan. He played in Japan years ago when they kind of barnstormed there in the offseason. Yeah. Back in my spy days, of course, I had to read about Mo Berg and his time going yeah. over to, to Asia and Japan and, and his role there. We are here to talk about uh, Felipe Alou. And, and I'll, I want to talk about his, and, and we discussed this off mic, so this is not like a big setup or anything, but I want to talk about his Hall of Fame credentials. We saw Jim Leland go in this week, and, and we know that Felipe will be one of the people they discuss for the next uh, round of the non-writer ballots. And what are the things we lose sight of, especially for younger folks who, who like I'm not the oldest guy on the road, but I'll be 54 next month. And, and we lose sight of just how hard it was to, to get in. Like, well, you know, someone posted a thing about Araldus Chapman, how big and bulky he is and compared him to, to, you know, Luke Gehrig and how Luke Gehrig would tremble at the side of Araldus Chapman. But, but if Araldus Chapman was born in 1905, oh my gosh, he, he, well, just look at Felipe Alou, who had to go work with his dad, dunking rocks into a rock grinder, and it forever damages his arm. And he should have really become a um, a, a, a doctor. And, and for just a couple of uh, circumstances to include a bill at the grocery market, he actually becomes a baseball player. I mean, how many, how many young Jewish athletes in New York City, born to immigrant parent, didn't even get to play baseball, right? I mean, it's just so hard in the early 1900s to even do that. So that aspect of Felipe and any immigrant or pre-immigrant in this story, uh, that, that candidacy, that access to the game was so improbable, especially if you didn't live in New York or, or somewhere in the, in the Midwest where the baseball game was available to you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to, it's funny because I saw a photo of Lou Gehrig a couple of weeks ago on, on X Twitter and he yeah. was in a gym. I don't know if you saw that. He's just wearing shorts. Yeah. That guy's ripped. And you know, my whole thing with guys from that era is I think they were extremely athletic hand-eye coordination has. And if they had the access to modern technology and, and modern uh, ways of fitness and working out, uh, they'd have been just as good or better than any of today's players. So um, some of those guys were just uh, physical specimens without the added benefit of, of, of modern workout and uh, technology and different things that goes into it. As far as uh, what you're talking about, uh, Felipe Alou's story is, is interesting because growing up, he never thought he could play Major League Baseball there were no black players, number one. And then uh, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. He actually saw Jackie Robinson play. He was uh, a boy, and they were uh, playing a spring training game in um, in the Dominican Republic. They were down there for spring training. And you got to realize that the Dodgers at that time uh, would, would take the team out of the United States when they could because of the racism and they'd go to some of the Caribbean countries and uh, they got out of school and they, and he actually saw Jackie play as a boy. And then it kind of dawned on him. Well, you know, they, there's black players, but still no Latino blacks. So it still was not something that he thought was available to him. Unbelievably smart man. One of the smartest persons I've ever run across in my 65 years 
uh, almost a photographic memory, wanted to become a doctor. His, his whole life, he wanted to become a doctor. And uh, he was he was the oldest of six children. They grew up in a 15 by 15 foot shack. Extremely poor. Uh, obviously, everybody knows about Maddie and, and Jesus. There was another brother, Juan. So there were four brothers. They lived under a, a dictator, Rafael Trujillo, that was brutal. People would disappear. Uh, there's a whole story in the book about what happened with Juan after Trujillo was assassinated and and he got caught up in the revolution. But his mom's brother was in the military, and dictators are, are notorious for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that they are brutal, and the other reason is they they really take care of their military so the military can take care of them. So there was an uncle with a little bit of money because he was high up in the military, and so because of that, they had the wherewithal as a poor family to send Felipe to the university in Santa Domingo. And he was at a point where he was starting to take some pre-med courses. He wanted to work. Uh, he used to see the mothers outside the hospital with their children in line to try to get medical help for their children. And he, that's what he wanted to do. And there's no doubt in my mind, he would have been a fantastic doctor. And one day he's walking by the track and field area and there's a javelin laying there and they go, Hey, you know, throw that javelin back to us. <laughs> And he picks up the javelin and throws it, and their eyes are like, whoa. And the coach comes over and says, you ever done this before? No. And, well, he turns out to set the country's record for the javelin throw and goes to the Pan Am Games as a track and field athlete, although he could play baseball, but they, always, they never played organized baseball. They just played with whatever they could find. Their dad was a carpenter. He would fashion bats out of wood and give it to the boys they'd find old baseball somewhere or they'd use coconuts you know on ripe and um they go to the pan am games in 55 and one of the players on the team gets sent home for insubordination so they came to felipe and they said you know sort of what we're talking about yeah baseball yeah. is more important than 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 you competing in track and field we need you on the baseball team so they switched him over to baseball and he led them to the gold medal. And that's when a scout Horatio rabbit, uh, I think his name was Martinez famous uh, Latino scout came to the house and said, you know, we want to sign your son to a, a contract, uh, 200 pesos, which is like 200 bucks. And the parents were adamant, no way. <laughs> and then um, came back a couple of weeks later with some of the, teammates and said, your son has a chance. Your son has a chance. And um, Felipe knew his father was struggling to feed the family and owed the grocer 200 pesos. So that's what he signed for 200 pesos and then comes to this country and immediately runs into racism in Louisiana. They wouldn't let him play. They had passed the law that blacks couldn't, couldn't work in the same workplace as white people. And that's when he got sent to Cocoa, Florida, and um, in his first year in the Florida State League, I think he batted 380, uh, won the batting title. Two years later, he's in the major leagues playing alongside Willie Mays. But he is, he is, Ozzy Virgil is the first born, the first person born in the Dominican to make it to Major League Baseball, but he's not Dominican. His family was from Turks and Caicos. They migrated to the DR, and then they came to the Bronx in New York, and he actually was in the U S military. And, uh, you know, he gets credited for being the first born Dominican, but Felipe is the first Dominican and the first born and raised Dominican to actually leave the country and become a major league player. So he is the pioneer for that country. Uh, he is Let me jump in here too, and and so I don't know how big the Pan Am Games were when they started, and I'm looking at a chart here, so I'm not pulling this from memory. But when the Dominican Republic wins in 1955, it is the second Pan Am Games. They don't sniff a medal for 25 more years. Cuba dominates the whole thing. Yeah. So I mean, this I mean, how improbable is this setup where you have enough talent on that team that that this thing even happens? And again, this goes to this whole thing of that. You know, a lot of these earlier players don't even have access to simple things like antibiotics. You know, <laughs> like it's just, 
it was hard to go out and do things like this. And so in 55, when he wins this gold medal, um, his, his parents must have been like, absolutely not. Like, there's no way this is a real thing. It really does just jump out of a bush and be like, hey, no, this kid's pretty good at this. Like, they must have been like, no, because, you know, all throughout the book, in the early part, you talk about, um, you know, they're making gloves out of canvas that came off of a truck. And, you know, all the standard Caribbean things, like we would take a crab and we would do that, you know. It must, if my kid came to me and that's how they were playing, I would be like, what? No. You know, come on. <laughs> no, yeah. not a chance, you know? Yeah. They, um, they, they, he goes back now and sees the little dirt field that they played on and he sees all the kids there still. And it's a different vibe now because that's, that's like black kids in this country historically from the inner cities and from poor areas. And in the South where I grew up, uh, that was their ticket to, to kind of right. make it. And, yeah. and, and the DR right now, that's, that's it. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the pressure that they have in that country now with all the academies is, is to make it in baseball. But when he was growing up, there was, there was no, it, there was no thought of making it and, and being able to support your family and to take care of your parents and all of those types of things. So when, it, when they came to him and came to his parents basically and said, uh, we want to sign your son, that was a ludicrous notion. Like my, my kid's going to make a living playing baseball? No, 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 no. He, he's going to become a medical doctor. <laughs> and, and and not that that was a bad choice either, but it wasn't, uh, for that family, it wasn't, we need him in the fields. We need him on the fishing boat, like uh, like the case with uh, Mariano Rivera in, in Panama. Uh, it was, it was he's going to become a doctor. And um, and he was the oldest of the, of the six kids. So that was the vibe that was going on in the country at the time. And then once he made it, he was very cognizant of what it took to make it, the, the cultural differences, the language differences. And, and when he was with the Giants, uh, you know, they, they got fined once for fraternizing. One time he was talking with Maddie before a game, and they, they find him for fraternizing. And he's like, I'm just talking to my, my brother. <laughs> I'm talking to my brother. And then Alvin Dark wouldn't allow the, the Latino players to speak Spanish. I mean, ridiculous stuff. So there, there was an article that came out in Sport Magazine with a guy named Arnold Haino, who was from Southern California. He died about a year or so ago at 99, I think. And it was, it was so prescient on Felipe's part that it was, a, it was a Latin player's Bill of Rights. And one of the things that he was advocating for was a, was a translator so that Latino players could communicate with, with the media and in other ways, which all the major league teams have now, and, and only in recent years. But he was advocating for that 60 years ago and right. for other things. I mean, they used to make fun of his – one of his closest friends was Roberto Clemente, and in the book we have a whole chapter of his friendship and relationship with Roberto Clemente. You know, the, the writers would make fun of, of the Latino players for their broken English. And and you want to just say, well, why don't you learn their language and, and then communicate with them as well? Or how would you like it if you were in, in uh, another country and they're making fun of the fact that you can't speak Spanish or French or whatever the case may be? Uh, and so he, he wrote this whole article, and um, it really caused the Giants to trade him at that point to what was in the Milwaukee Braves because they didn't like that he was kind of, a, a, in their eyes, a, a bit of a militant, you know, too much of a, a guy pushing the cause of black Latino players. Um, and the other thing that, that he ran into when he came here was not just white racism, but black racism. Mm -hmm. and, and, Pete, it's kind of surprising to me. We didn't put some of the names in the book for obvious reasons. He didn't want to do it. But there were black players that were very prejudiced towards them and some Hall of Fame black players that uh, none were his teammate. But but uh, there was one particular player that he said was racist towards them. And this guy was at the forefront of, of advancing black players being able to get uh, a field manager jobs and those types of things. So, you know, the attitude was, 
yeah, you can come into our neighborhoods, you can eat at our restaurants, you can get a haircut here, but don't date our women and things like that. So there was there was a lot they had to overcome. And and when when I look at how baseball and the Hall of Fame has properly honored the Negro League players and put them in the statistic books. And 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 even though they didn't have Major League Baseball careers, they are in the Hall of Fame. They need to start doing that for Latin players uh, and guys right. like Felipe Alou. That guy didn't get to manage until he was almost 60 years old because yeah. he was black and Latino. And and had he managed like Joe Torre, you look at Joe Torre's playing stats and Felipe Alou's playing stats, they're, they're very similar. And he, he was similar. roommates with Joe Torre. Joe Torre became a player manager at the age of, think of 38 years old, a player manager, and then got to manage all those years and then finally got to manage the Yankees and won the World Series, and now he's in the Hall of Fame. We had lunch a few years ago in Boston. It was myself, Tony La Russa, my friend Bruce Bochy, um, and, and we were talking with Felipe and Dave Dombrowski. And, and I told Tony, who, who's a big advocate for Felipe to be in the Hall of Fame, I said, Tony, had Felipe just started to manage around 40 years old, like a lot of guys did, and just consistently managed through the years and won an, a, a decent amount of games, I said he'd be top five all time. If the 1994 season had not been canceled and the Expos, everybody knew the Expos had the best team, the best record, and they were surging at the end of the season, he might have that 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 World Series on his resume as a manager. Uh he'd be a lock for the hall of fame, but we're going to penalize him because of racism and prejudice that they wouldn't. And Dombrowski told me, he said, one of the great, one of the great regrets he has was not recognizing his managerial talent earlier. And when he, he hired a, a, a Cora up at Boston, he said, I wasn't going to make the state, same mistake that I made with Felipe Alou. And he hired Alex Cora up there. Uh, to be the manager of the Boston Red Sox, who's been, you know, by and large, a very good manager for the Red Sox. And now you see a lot of Latino managers. Felipe was that pioneer. So let's honor him by putting him in the Hall of Fame for the totality, a holistic view of what his his mark has been in in, in baseball. Uh, the, first, the first Dominican to play in the World Series, have a front office job, you know, managed – Expos, Giants, and a, and a and a very very good career as a player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a part of that case is that well, first off, he is the father of all of the Dominican Repl Republic players that come after him, right? He does recognize it. He does do the job of cutting the grass and saying this is this is what it takes to get there, right? And uh, does integrate into the game and it is hard and the, the Dombrowski's of the world do have to miss it because he is a pioneer and there is some grace offered in these cases normally because the pioneers don't get all the breaks it does take them to come and, and do these things first and we do we do say hey um someone like Doby or uh, gosh you know there's so many cases of this where we're like at ah, we didn't get it right and we held this person back for a certain amount of time Josh give Gibson did just miss his opportunity. We're going to give him some grace. And you're 100% right. Like anytime there's labor strife in baseball, like we talked about Harold Baines off mic, you know, he he misses out on enough games where you're like, you know, 3,000 hits come, becomes a possibility because he does miss out on enough games where, you know, 2,900 plus hits becomes a reality for him. And, 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 you know, that maybe he's still a borderline case, but it, it makes him a better player. And these guys are fighting for something that goes down the road. And that for sure impacts a lose career as a manager. If that team goes out, they don't get that chance to prove it on the field. So I, I definitely agree with you there. But just the legacy, all the players he impacts, Bochi is in a lose managerial tree. You know, uh, all these guys, Leland all kinds of people because he has been around for so long and he does manage at the lower levels and he shapes careers. You, you mentioned Galarraga in the book and, and the, in that bill of rights. And, and even during that time in the, uh, in the sixties where he talks about, you guys don't understand the, the political strife that we have to go through to, to deal with our world. We're not from the U S 
you guys have a completely different financial reality than us. All of these things, he had to be willing to speak up for everybody from his nation and, and really from his part of the world. You know, it's interesting. On my um, X Twitter uh, handle right now, the, 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 the top post is a review of the book from Gary Thorne, the, the, the great announcer, Gary Thorne. And, you know, not here's the book. Okay. So Gary Thorne, Gary Thorne, uh, in the review, he does a video review of the book and he makes the comment that this is the first time we've gotten the Jackie Robinson story from a Latino's point of view. So if anybody wants right. to go on X and watch that video, that's what he says. And he talks about how in this narrative of his life, he weaves in and out, uh, you know, all the different things that he had to go through. And, and part of it is, he had a he got to put up with a lot like like the pioneering black players did because he knew the consequences of lashing out the consequences of retaliating when he could not play in louisiana now you know we we made a big deal 20 odd years ago when derek jeter broke into major league baseball about this mixed race player a black father and a white mother Felipe alou has got a black father, had a black father. They're both deceased now, and his mother was white. And in growing up in the DR, there was no, there was no racism. You know, it, it, whether you were black or white or, you know, you go to Jamaica, sort of the same thing in some of the other Latin countries. He said, I understood academically that racism existed in the United States, but I, I never experienced it in the DR. And I, had, and I came from a mixed race family. Then I go to Louisiana and I'm hearing the N word. Uh, I'm not able to play. They won't let me play. And eventually the New York Giants at the time saw what was going on in the Evangeline League in, in Louisiana. And they put him on a Greyhound bus. And all he knew how to do was say Coco because that was where he was supposed to go. And it was back then just two lane roads through every town. He just had enough money to, to put into the vending machine to get some peanuts out. And he's traveling all the way to Cocoa, Florida. And he said, all I really wanted to do, I knew the last stop was Miami. I wanted to go all the way to Miami, get on a flight, go back to the DR and go back to school and become a doctor. He said, but I had, I had my family name on the line. I had signed a contract. And I felt like I was representing my country. Anybody that would come after me, I didn't want to ruin their chances. So he gets off the bus in Cocoa, Florida, which is right near where I grew up. And he sleeps on a park bench overnight. And then he, uh, he meets, it's in the black area of town. A woman sees him and he, she's talking to him when, in, in the early morning hours. She realizes he's a, a ball player for the Cocoa Indians, takes him to where some other Latino players are. And then he, he gets his career going, but he had the presence of mind as a young man to realize that like the Jackie Robinson story, I'm representing not just myself. This is bigger than me. And, and, and I, and I've got to, I've got to put up with a lot and I've got to go through a lot to pave the way for those who might come behind me. And then when his career ended, he, he recognized that there were a lot of, a lot of, for cultural reasons, there were a lot of times when, when players were coming over to America as 18-year-olds, and it's not like an 18-year-old kid that grows up here and he's going away from minor league baseball and he's homesick. I mean, Derek Jeter has talked openly about how he cried every night his first year in, my, in minor league baseball. I mean, he was homesick. I mean, think of when we maybe went off to college at 18 and we think we're adults now and we're boohooing because, you know, we're away from our moms and our family. Magnify that by being away from your country. Magnify that by not being able to read a menu or know how to pay for something and, and, and being surrounded by people, at least when you're in college or you're on a minor league team, you're surrounded by your peers. And so yeah. he, had, he had the presence of mind to realize that there were a lot of Dominican kids that came here and struggled, not because of baseball, but because of these other reasons and then didn't make it and went back, but still had the talent. So he and Julian Javier started kind of a, a, 
a, a, a summer league over there for, for these guys to still play baseball and maybe still get noticed. And that morphed into all of the academies now that exist in the Dominican Republic. And the San Francisco Giants Academy is named after Felipe Alou. So you start looking at what the DR has produced now and, and the Hall of Fame players that it has produced. And his impact on that alone should get him into the Hall of Fame. Pedro Martinez tells me, he goes, you don't understand what he means to Dominican players. He goes, he goes, you, you in this country, you study about uh, Jim Thorpe and Babe Ruth in your history books. When we're in elementary school, Felipe Alou is in our history books mm -hmm. because if, if not for him, you know, it, it, it would have set it back to what, how the rest of us could have come and done what we do. Uh, and then you, you look at um, Pedro. He insisted that the Dodgers trade for pay, that the that they trade for the Pedro from the Dodgers with Montreal, and, and 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 they didn't believe in Pedro. They thought he was he was he was not big enough. You know, scrawny kid. He had coached Pedro in in the winter league in in the DR, and Pedro told me that there was a a, a game where there was a long rain delay, a really long rain delay. And so the rain lifted, and Pedro's going out to pitch. And he goes, "Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute." He goes, "You're you're not going out there to pitch." He goes, uh, "He goes, you're a prospect. You you got uh, you got a future." He goes, "I'm not going to jeopardize your arm for this." And Pedro said, "I didn't even know he knew who I was hardly, and he's recognizing my ability." He gave me such confidence at that point. Then they trade for him. I think it was uh, Delano De Shields. And, and Pedro still doesn't know if he's got what it takes for Major League Baseball. Spring training, he calls Pedro in, and he says, um, he says, uh, I want you to know you're a starter for me. You're a starter. You're my number four starter. But when I give you the ball on that day, you're, not, you're my number one starter that day. And, and he goes, if you could see my, my chest swelling, and uh, and when they when they couldn't keep him when it, when they knew he was going to be a free agent he insisted that Pedro get traded to a team where he could get noticed and he could maybe win a World Series. Pedro Martinez in the Hall of Fame. Vladimir Guerrero when he could not manage in the major leagues and they wanted they kept him in the minor leagues. He said, "Don't keep me at AAA. Put me at Single A where I can develop the young talent." Mm. All yeah. those guys, the Randy Johnsons. And the others that he had in single-A ball will all tell you, if not for him and the way he taught the game and the way he developed me, I may not be a Hall of Famer, much less a major league player uh, for a career. It's unbelievable what this guy has done. And it's no surprise that the Giants and the Dodgers go out to the Dominican Republic and they find these players. And then also – I, I don't know if you and Felipe have talked about this, but a guy like Mike Brito who goes out and he starts to pull prospects out of Mexico because Mike and Felipe, well, Mike's passed on now, but he um, he was basically the same age as Felipe. And and though players came out of Mexico, no one really stuck until after like like Felipe was an established player. And so all of this stuff is happening during that time. And so even if Felipe doesn't have a direct impact role on that, you know, teams like the Dodgers are saying, who can go out into Mexico and go pull a Fernando Valenzuela out of there? It's because they realize these are hotbeds of baseball talent, you know, in Venezuela and all these other places. It all cones out of Felipe and a few other people. But he is – it's it's crazy because Rachel Robinson is still alive. Felipe is still with us. Ozzy Virgil Sr. is still with us. These guys are still out there, and these are like the very earliest – bits of the, the game that are still with us in a game that's 170 years old. These uh, early uh, moments and timers, these walking histories are out there still. And I, I totally agree that uh, some Cuba, of them is that important. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, on and on, right. With all these, all these different uh, Island nations that have, have taken on. And, and it's also, uh, I want to go back a few minutes in, in the conversation. We often forget that Dominican Republic is, is like one third of Hispanola. And so if you're born on the other half, oh, two thirds, yeah. Haiti's the other third. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's the bigger side though, Haiti. Right. And if you're, no, Haiti's a smaller side, Haiti's a smaller side. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Okay. It's um, 
you know, if you're born a hundred miles in the other direction, you know, it's, you're born on the wrong know. side. They don't play baseball and, no. and you don't have that option. So it's, it's just, it's really a luck of the draw on, on uh, which island that you're, which side of the island that you're born on. It's Either way. Um, yeah, it is. And if you see it on a, a satellite image, Haiti is a wasteland. It's really a desert because they've chopped down all their trees. The Dominican Republic for as, as wanting as it can be as a population, they, they have a lot more resources, largely because they discovered baseball. And again, that comes partly because of that. Did you guys ever discuss how how baseball got to the Dominican Republic and, and how it stuck? Is there like a a, a Padre de Baseball um, for the island, that side? Um, I know as a boy, they would pick up radio from Cuba. And the Dodgers were always big down there. And, and because of Jackie Robinson, and, and they were at the forefront of getting uh, Dominican uh, or Cuban and Puerto Rican players. Yeah, I'm looking at a map now to make sure I'm correct. Yeah, the DR is about two-thirds. Estevan Florial, the, um, the Yankees' uh, perennial prospect who's never panned out for them, he's been kind of a, a quadruple-A player for them. He, he evidently is from Haiti, <laughs> but... Hmm kind of came across and grew up in in the in the Dominican Republic and then at that point he was able to play the sport so you wonder how many good athletes might be from the other side in in, in Haiti but yeah. um yeah that's a good question I there there was a book and I'm going by memory now that yeah that I remember researching a little bit about uh the history of baseball in the Dominican Republic um but but mostly it was it was through Cuba and Puerto Rico that it was it was kind of spreading to those other countries, but only only the Dominican, not not the other Caribbean countries uh, so much. I mean, there's there's um, um, Korea. I forget which country he's from in, in the Caribbean um, and, and some of those other islands, you know, Bahamas, you know, every mm -hmm. once in a while there'll be a player emerge. But there's no other country. The Dominican Republic has more players in the major leagues per capita than any other country in the world. That's so crazy. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable. And and so they've they've really every every team has an academy there now. And so they'll 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 see a kid 14, 15 years old, they'll they'll sign him to some kind of contract. He'll go to the academy, which is base, basically like the Boletary Academy or IMG over here in Florida, and they'll educate them. You know, they'll get a high school de degree or whatever the equivalent is, but then it's very baseball oriented. <laughs> and then if they develop enough, then they'll, they'll go into the minor league system, but they're all there now. They're, they all have yeah. academies and they're state of the art academies because they recognize the talent but they also recognize the fervor for baseball in that country. You know, you, you go around that country now. Uh, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we played pickup baseball. <laughs> we, we'd go in the summer times to the, the Little League field or the Babe Ruth field at the time, and we'd ride there with our gloves hooked into our handlebar, and we'd play baseball. And, and, and you know, just pick up sides. If we didn't have enough kids, we'd close off right field or left field, depending on who was batting. You, you drive through Puerto Rico. My wife and I did that once, you know, got away, drove the island. And you're like, you're driving through and you're looking around. It's like, look at all those kids were just playing baseball. You never see that in this country. <laughs> you Everything is travel league and, and organized and all that. Those kids are just playing for the love of the game, but recognizing all the superstars that have emerged. And they all have that dream of, of making it out and making it big in Major League Baseball. It's huge down there, uh, and and it's and it's been tapped into by Major League Baseball. And so now, as I mentioned, the DR has more Major League players per capita than any other country in the world. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a crazy thing the the amount of people that come out of there, and uh, it, it seems possible that Curacao will have its first person if um, if uh, Andrew Jones gets Andrew elected. Jones. You know, and, yeah. and he seems like it's possible for him. What what I don't want to see happen, and the Hall of Fames seem to get this wrong, like 
Hey, Ron Santo, you've been talking about it your whole life, and you sure as heck deserve it. Once you're dead, then we're going to let you out. I hate that. Kenny Stabler. Everybody from Oakland loves Kenny Stabler. He's the kind of guy, and then they, he dies, and he gets elected. And then for – I'm going to curse here because it fucking makes me mad. But, you know, for fuck's sake, Buck O'Neill has to die. And yeah. then they let him in. I so saw. I don't want that to happen with Felipe Olu. I mean, let's just do this thing so we can see the moment. I know he's 88, right? Like – all right, time's a waste, and let's not continue to get this wrong. And and if we are wrong, and if we let him in too soon, there's plenty of guys like Little Poison. You know, it's like just because he's got his big brother was great doesn't mean that he needs to be in there. Let's make another error on the side of let's get it done while while Felipe's alive. It's it's my uh, impassioned uh, cry yeah. for for this to happen. And by the way, in the baseball life, here it is. You know, pretty solid player. Pretty solid co you know, career as a manager. And if he would have had a full managerial career, as you said, very likely he would have had 2,000 wins and, and just gone on and on and on because he definitely had the skills. I mean, like in, in the book, you, you make this great point. It was like, oh, if it's a test on my ability, uh, well, then I'll well, it should be a long career. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was one of the things that when he got the Expos job, Buck Showalter told me, and, you know, Leland and, and LaRusa. Uh, these are brilliant managers, brilliant managers. Buck told me that Felipe was schooling him when they were, were managing against him in the minor leagues. And and there were times when Felipe would make a move and Buck would look over and he couldn't figure it out. And then later he figured out what he would do. And then he'd look back over at Felipe and he'd see him smiling like, I just learned something here. I'm, I'm, I'm not just managing against you. I'm in school and you're, you're tutoring me, you're teaching me, but you're beating me at the same time. And everybody talks about Buck's brilliant mind for managing. And he's telling me, this guy, this guy was out managing me and outsmarting me. And right. yet Buck gets to manage and Buck's, you know, I, I've known Buck for a number of years. I'm not knocking Buck, but Buck gets to manage the New York Yankees at a very yeah. young age and has this you know, other than the, the you know what's held over him is the postseason, has this really good career, and you know if he had won a World Series and he's kind of a borderline Hall of Famer right now, but then you look at Felipe Alou, and and Leland and Larusa they love the guy and they'll tell you how hard it was to manage against him, but Felipe didn't get the chance, and it wasn't because of ability, it was because of skin color and being Latino. <laughs> And now you've got the Alex Cores and the, and you know, so many of these guys that are managing now, and it's not even an after, not even a thought. Like, he's the best guy for the job, and guess what? He's bilingual, even better. <laughs> and and they're yeah, managing. Yeah. So yeah, you know, and he, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, continue. Go ahead. No, no, and, and guys, guys that played for him. They'll, they'll tell you how much they learned. And, and Felipe's always teaching. It, it's not just you're watching him and you're learning. He's, he's always explaining why he's doing things. He's always passing on knowledge. And, and some of these guys would tell me about his, his, his mind, how, 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 not only how smart he was, but his, his ability for memory. Guys would tell me that, you know, let's say they, 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 were, they played for him with, with the Expos and they played the Cardinals in May. And now all of a sudden it's late August and they're playing the Cardinals again. And somebody's going up in the seventh inning to face a middle reliever that has come in. He'll pull the guy back and say, hey, hey. he goes, uh, hold on a second. He goes, you remember the last time you faced this guy? He, he started you out with a fastball and then he remembered the sequence of pitches that this guy had thrown and the guy going to the plate would say, I barely even remember facing this pitcher. And he's telling me the sequence of pitches. Um, he, he had saber metrics in his head <laughs> before right. saber metrics even became a word. So there's no doubt in my mind, this guy would have been an all time, one of the all time winningest managers in major league history. Had he just had the opportunity to manage all those years and likely would have had, if he didn't have to start out with a low budget franchise like the Montreal Expos, it started out like a Buck Showalter with the New York Yankees 
with that payroll, he'd have had some World Series. So don't don't let's not penalize him because of of the of the prejudice against black Latino people being able to manage in the major leagues. Let's let's put him in. And yeah, uh, when he, black there. When he had good teams, he won, right? And if you yeah. don't have players, you can't make you can't make the players be better than they are. We he um he mentioned in the book and, and we talked about this offline. I, I lived on Sheffield um, Avenue in Chicago in a rooftop building in 2003 my buddy gary o'reilly was standing behind steve bartman he was in the row behind him he's in the shot and he's looking up at the ball you know and it's crazy and and uh, felipe mentions that play because what happens and this is like a thing and i don't know what a manager does but felipe would know you know okay so you don't get the break when his son moises goes towards the crowd and, and he doesn't get to make that play whether or not he would have made the play is kind of regardless but then there was a tailor-made double play ball to alex gonzalez and he botches it. And that's really what changes the tide of that game. And that's where I think Felipe knows what to do. Maybe he walks out to the mound and, and resets everything. Or who knows what he does. But that's the difference. It's not what some fan does when he does what he's supposed to when he goes for a ball that he can reach. That's the whole point of Wrigley. You're right there. The fans are right there by the uh, by the action. So did did he talk at all about what he might have done in that situation? or or Because you talked about... He talked several times about the blending of people say analytics, like statistics are new. Like they've always talked tendencies, always someone keeping the book. Don Zimmer is sitting there for 50 years keeping books. You think Don Zimmer doesn't know what's what's going to happen next? I mean, these guys know this stuff. So did, did Felipe talk with you at all about what these tendencies are and what his brain is seeing? The thing that he mentioned is, Statistics and analytics have always existed in baseball. All right. Traditionally, it was: Do you have a leadoff guy that has a high batting average and, a, and can steal bases? Uh, you know, gets on base with walks and bunts. You know that the lineups were always traditionally sequenced according to statistics: right. batting average, power, all of those different things. And then the one thing he he has mentioned is you know, F war and all these different advanced statistics that exist today. He goes, all the teams have that. Everybody's yeah. got the same data. So it still comes down to what are you going to do? Not only with the data, but what your eyes see with the players on the field, what goes on here when, when, when it's uh, bottom of the ninth, is that a guy that likes to be up at the plate? You know, all those all those intangible things that kind of get – have kind of been shoved to the wayside because it, it's been looked at strictly statistically and analytically. You know, that's starting to come back with what we've seen with Dusty Baker and Bruce Bochy and 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 now, you know, now the, the pendulum is sort of swinging for, towards guys that can take the information – but also look and see what's going on on the field, what they know is going on in the clubhouse. You know, who, who, who's the guy that likes the limelight, the pressure? Uh, is somebody battling an injury? You know, all those types of things. Uh, so that's all he has said about it is he's not, he's not poo-pooing the data. He's right. just saying it's all, it's all there for everybody. So what's going to separate you from everybody else? how you use the data and how you use the talent that you have in front of you. Yeah. And the, the reality is, is that uh, 30 teams enter this season, one team wins. And so we've lost our minds about how exciting and fun the Phillies are. They have not won, you know, and it's like they lose. And, and most of the time it's a 50, 50 coin flip, you know, uh, Pablo Sandoval hit three home runs in the world series. All of that was improbable. You know, you're just stacking improbable, unlikely things that happen and it seems like it's because a player did that on purpose but it, a lot of it is just something has to happen this thing happened the other thing easily could have happened but it didn't and and so much of it is just i don't want to say chance i don't want to say luck but it's just it's so uncontrollable you're, you're just saying i've got an advantage of 50.2 over your 49.8 I'll take the advantage and it doesn't go your way. 
You know, like that's just a lot of the times that's that, but a good manager understands that. And is and like, they decide to go against the numbers or with the numbers, or they just disregard the numbers and goes, this is my guy. Much like um, Grady little. He's like, I'm going to go with Pedro. You know, he's my guy and I'm going to stick with him. It blows up in his face. He loses his job, but that's the game. Yeah. And that was, um, Oh boy. Now I'm his, the, the picture that he had with the giants that just was, um, uh, but anyway, the, the starting picture yeah. that um, part of it is when you feel like your manager is just managing by a spreadsheet, mm. I, I would I would think as a player that's frustrating. Give me a chance. And that's what they say about guys like Bruce Bochy is, is uh, he – he saw something in me that wasn't on that sheet of paper. And then I want to go out and prove him right. <laughs> I want to win for him and for my teammates and obviously for myself. So that's where, you know, a manager comes into play uh, where, where you, like Pedro said, when he gave me that ball in spring training and said, you're going to be one of my starters. Cause Pedro didn't know if he was going to be a reliever or a middle reliever or whatever. And he gave him the ball. He actually handed him a ball in his office in spring training and said, I'm going to give you this ball every four days, five days, or whatever it was. He goes, uh, you're going to be my number four starter, my number five starter. But when you're when you, when it's your day, you're my number one guy. Mm. That that means a lot. He didn't pull him in and say, you know, you you, you know, against uh against uh, right-handed hitters or this or that or the other thing. Uh, he knows all the numbers. They both know all the numbers. There's got to be a human element to it that Felipe and other great managers brought to the table to get the most out of their talent and to know when to put in a guy in a certain situation that that analytics is just not going to provide you the answer for that. That's where, I mean, it's not stratomatic. <laughs> It's it, 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 it's it's a lot more than that. Otherwise, everybody could do it. You mentioned another interesting case for the Hall of Fame, someone we don't think of as being very close, but Dennis Martinez goes through the 81 work stoppage, 94-95. You can easily tack on five more wins, and, and that's just being easy. You know, there's, there's maybe as many as 10 wins if he gets hot, and that puts him 250-255 range. That's a lot of wins, man. That's a lot of wins. And, you know, he, um, he, he plays for Felipe and you guys mentioned him in the book and, and you wonder about what that looks like. And is it the end of the world? If we put a guy in the first guy from Nicaragua in, in the hall of fame and I, I'm not, look, I'm a big hall guy. So I'm not opposed to, you know, to giving Nicaraguans their guy and saying, Hey, we're going to enshrine this guy. Sure. He's a compiler, but there's something to be said. To, to be set for staying around and, and being the first dude from Nicaragua and, and letting them have their dude. But um, talk a little bit about Felipe and what he had to say about Nicaraguan uh, Dennis Martinez, the uh, generalissimo. Yeah. El Presidente. Yes. Um, he, um, when he became manager of the Montreal Expos, Dennis Martinez was the ace of the staff and he must've seen something that Dennis was, um, he wanted Dennis to know that he believed in Dennis, but that he was the manager. So he didn't really get into too much, but he, he likely saw that Dennis wasn't respecting the decisions of some of the other managers. I think it was his first game that he managed. Dennis Martinez was the pitcher, and he had told him when he became the manager, he goes, I, I want you to know basically how much I, I believe in you and your talent and what you do. But when I come out for the ball, I'm coming out for the ball. <laughs> and the yeah. message was, don't show me up. Don't, don't, don't debate me. If I'm coming out, I'm coming out for a reason and I'm coming out for the ball. And um, Martinez won the first game. I think that Felipe managed and Felipe took him out for a reliever. And after the game, Dennis brought the ball in for his first major league managerial win and as a gesture gave him the ball. And it was a it was a sign of mutual respect, of yeah. mutual respect. 
The interesting thing about some of the guys that we're mentioning, Randy Johnson's, the Andres Galarragas, the Vladimir yeah. Guerrero's, and some of the other players, especially on that 94 Expos team, that assemblage of talent was developed by Felipe Alou in the minor leagues. That's right. So there's something to be said organizationally. You know, you talk about the Yankees' core four, the Fab Five, as I like to call them, because I think Bernie Williams is in there. There's something to be said about assembling a core of players that grew up together and that bond that they have. Not only did the Expos have that with that, that, that 94 team, but that bond was also <laughs> with Felipe as their manager in the minor leagues. Right. So they had something really special going on in Montreal. And when the World Series was canceled that season, I forget who it was from the Braves because the Braves and the Expos used to uh, share a spring training site. It's in the book. But after the season was over, Felipe run in, ran into one of the Braves players at, at the uh, spring training site in the, in the winter. And, and the player said, I want you to know, we knew you were the better team. And they were surging. So there was a lot of excitement that, okay, we couldn't win it in 94, but we'll come back and win it in 95. And then when the strike was settled and uh, whoever is Sonnemeyer on the Supreme Court was um, uh, the one who made the ruling, arbitration, um, the Expos disbanded that whole team, John Wetland yeah. and, and all of them. And so they never had a chance uh, to, to see if they could do it. Expos never even had their own stadium. Olympic Stadium was just a holdover from the Olympics. So it's a real shame uh, what has happened in Montreal and a real shame for, uh, for, for me personally, and Felipe doesn't feel this way, but again, had he had a chance to manage for just, just not a low budget team, just a middle budget team that, that, that could have, kept players like that together and, and seeing what they could have done. He would have done a lot. <laughs> I guarantee he would have done yeah. a lot. Yeah. And there is something, there's something to be said, like you were talking about the vertical aspect of the management thing, you know, and, and there's a lot of these managers that, uh, that do come up that way, you know, and, and you, there's guys like Tommy Lasorda who basically talks Earl oral Hershiser into being a great player. You know, because he does bulldog, but yeah, and it you know, nobody in their right mind puts Kirk Gibson at the plate against Dennis Eckersley. Kirk Gibson is done, he will never, ever, ever again be a prime player, right? That he doesn't belong at the plate, he is injured, he's barely gonna play the next two years. He does play, but he's done as a prime player, he's got no business being up there. But somehow those two maniacs, Kirk and Tommy, they could they delude themselves into making this magic moment happen. It's insane, and and uh, there's something in modern baseball where we don't have a lot of that uh, belief. Where like you you take a player, and uh, you see something in them. And and Felipe throughout the book, he's like, I saw that in Randy Johnson. I mean, Randy Johnson makes no sense when he shows up in a ball, and he's he's. Not only is he Nuke Lelouch, he's 6'10 Nuke Lelouch, you know, and, right. and it's just to to understand that it's going to be okay. That, like, yeah, we can get you sorted out. There's something there to see that and make him believe it. It's uh, that, that really says something to me. Hey, I, I don't want to keep you too long, Ooh, and we're going to run out of time. So, um, but just stick the landing here. What are your three big points on the Hall of Fame case for Felipe Alou? His holistic approach, uh, not approach, but his holistic history to Major League Baseball, not only as a player and a manager and also a pioneering Latino that, that paved the way. Uh, again, Gary Thorne, the great announcer, calls it the, the Jackie Robinson story for Latino players, but also his impact on, on all the academies in the Dominican Republic and this was a guy who also managed annually every winter in Puerto Rico and in Venezuela, discovered Andres Galarraga as a pudgy kid, pitched a fit when they wanted to release him in organizational meetings and said, you, really, you get rid of him, you might as well get rid of me. And so they kept yeah. Galarraga. Now he's in the Hall of Fame. 
And then there's that whole family aspect uh, with his two brothers, his son, Moises. Uh, Luis Rojas is his son, the former Mets manager and, and now the Yankees third base coach. Uh, he's got a couple of other sons in organizations now that have uh, major league managerial aspirations. I mean, there is a um, uh, the guy played with Willie Mays, played with Hank Aaron, held Adrian Beltre as a baby, managed Barry Bonds, roommates with Joe Torre, roommates with Orlando Cepeda, roommates with Willie McCovey. Not that that makes you a Hall of Famer, but but he is the Zelig. <laughs> Of, of so much of the history of this game from the 1950s down until this day, put him in. <laughs> There's the, yeah. Put him in the Hall of Fame and, and tell his story. And then if you tell his story and, and, and you read his story in this book, tell me that you don't think he's a Hall of Famer and one of the all-time great contributors to the game of baseball. If you're looking up here at the top here, I'm going to put the, uh, the link for the book. It's right up it's right there. And you know what I always say? Buddy, read, buy two copies, and then post about it and say Felipe Alou is a Hall of Famer. And that way, when this next round of uh, voting comes up, there'll be some some buzz. Because amazingly, there's barely anything written about Felipe's Hall of Fame case, and that needs to change. It's a simple thing. It's just posting and talking about it. That might uh, there, There's a great uh, article by Kevin Kernan, who worked for a variety of papers, New York Post and in, in San Diego. He, work, he writes for Ball Nine, and if you go to Kevin's uh, Twitter and uh, X and also Facebook, about a week or so ago when Leland went in, he wrote and he interviewed me for the for the column, really laying out the case for Felipe in the Hall of Fame, and that can be found Kevin Kern and K E R N A N also on X. It's a it's a great article where he uh, promotes the case for Felipe in the Hall of Fame as well, but not much beyond that as you mentioned. I'm going to put this link up right now. And so keep talking for a second and vamp for me as I get everything set to go here. Yeah. So, um, you know, there, the, the, there's so many interesting things in the book, you know, culturally. Um, a lot of people don't know that after Rafael Trujillo was assassinated in the Dominican Republic, it threw the country into a civil war and there were factions fighting for control and there was a socialist that uh, the people wanted to be their president. And the United States didn't want that because they already had uh, communism in Cuba and they were afraid of another prime Dominican country falling to communism. And so they occupied the island. It's a, it's a practically an unknown fact in U.S. history. But not only did they occupy the island, they took over the house that Felipe bought for his parents in Santo Domingo. They just said, you got to get out of here. We're using this as a military base. And his brother Juan stayed in the house and the U.S. soldiers were in that house and they're looking at family photos and they see Felipe, Maddie, and Jesus on the wall. And they go, are these, uh, are, they, are you related to the Alou brothers? And Juan goes, those are my brothers. They were occupied. That's how crazy it was. Felipe goes home in the wintertime and he's standing on a street in his neighborhood and a U.S. military jeep comes by and says, you got to get off this street. This is a military road now. He said, this is my hometown. This is my my neighborhood. And the guy pulls out. It's a kid, like an 18 year old soldier, pulls out a gun and points it at him and says, you don't get off the street right now. We're taking you. And it's like a, this notorious prison that they were going to take him to. Felipe Alou, major league player. And he goes, I'm listening to the accent of this punk mm. kid pointing a rifle at me. And it's the same accent I heard in Louisiana because it's a very distinct accent. When I was told in that country, I can't play because of my skin color. Now this accent is in my country telling me I can't stand on my, a street in my neighborhood. Yeah. This is the garbage this man had to go through to be a pioneer to advance the cause of, of baseball in the Caribbean nation of the Dominican Republic. Let's vote in Felipe Lou, everybody. All right, stand by one sec, Peter. I'll be right back to you. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here, 
are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. 